healthcare. We distribute the Nobel Lung and Active Systems in the UK. I've been with Inspiration now for um, nearly 12 years, having seen the, the growth and change uh, progression as these things happen, and this is nearly the latest model. You've got there's some new adaptations that are coming, um, and I'll explain those as they come. Um, rules of engagement really are, there's no such thing as a stupid question in these four walls. I've broken that rule a few times beforehand, so please feel free to ask those questions. If you can't see at the back when we come to do the machine, let me know, and um, we'll all sort of hug, hug round, I guess. Principle will be that I'll show you the priming of the system, and then we'll put it onto the machine, and then we'll go from there. And any questions, as I say, just, just ask as we go. It's a little bit difficult to do this without it being a, a live system with a sterile field, because it's already opened up, but we'll try and go through that as well as, as we need to. When you open up the pack, it will come nearly complete. What you'll need to do is to put this U-bend in to make this uh, a complete shunt, and that will be um, just forced on here. Top tip is not to force these in too much because you need to take these off eventually when you're going to put them onto the cannula that are in the patient ready to go, so just bear that in mind. So if someone has got the, the, the thumbs of a, a, the Hulk, and they'll need to undo that or they'll end up snapping this off, which is a bit painful, but just bear that in mind. There is a complete system here uh, in the loop, and what you have is connect up your bag of fluid. Now the fluid can be Hartman's, it can be saline, it can be hep saline, that's your choice really. There's no rights or wrongs with that depending on the anticoagulation needs of the patient and if they're a trauma patient you might want to reconsider but, but that's generally the rule, a bag of fluid. Another top tip, um, these here are CVVH ports and they have a, um, a locking plastic cap on here. These can become loose in transit. What they do ask you to do, and there is normally a little band on here which says uh, remove the, the safety caps and tighten these up. The last thing you want to do is to have this system set up and these to leak, because that's a pain in the backside for anyone to handle. When you also set the system up for the first time, the three-way taps will come in the bag, and this is the next development. The three-way taps are going to be obsolete. There will be um, integrated transducers into the system, which will make life a lot easier, so there's no weakness or weakness in the, in the system. Um, I've seen the pictures of it, I've been told it's due in January, um, I'm not holding my breath just yet, but that's the way things work, it's a matter of having something ready to go and then having the paperwork for sales ready to go, so that's the two different things, but don't, don't get too excited, it might come after our winter, who knows. So, with the loop set up, connect your bag of fluid, and you have your ILA membrane here. And there are two yellow caps on here. These are the de-airing de ports. There's a hydrophobic membrane in here that will be a patent. As your fluid comes in, your air will come out, and that will be displaced. You need to remove those caps, and we'll save those for later. If you look to see, if you hold the lung uppermost, we should start to fill from the bottom upwards. And this is a passive priming. The idea of this is really that we, we're saving time by doing it this way. It's a lot quicker. And we can... Um, with due diligence, make sure we are altruistic to make sure there's no bubbles in here. Bubbles are bad things. And bear in mind it's a sterile field as well. We maybe wouldn't have that dragon on the floor just yet. But once you've got that sealed with fluid, you should be able to just coil that round. There are a few places in here that can trap water or fluid. Uh, it's in the elbows here, and these can manipulate and move around, so you don't have to have that as a square, that can be as a diamond, and I have that uppermost because these are the de-airing ports here, and one other place is within the, the impeller, which is here. So make sure that we get the fluid through here, without the bubbles. Any bubbles as you go, just give it a tap with a pen, finger of your hand, whichever is easiest in your sterile field, not a pen. Okay, and then we should start to see, even with the keen eyes at the back, and get a fluid level, we should rise up. We want to make sure that disappears completely to the top of the, uh, the, the diamond. There's a temptation to squeeze this bag, so make sure you speed that up, don't do that, because the fibres and membranes in here. Um, can crack potentially under higher pressures. You'd have to be spectacularly clumsy to do it, but it's not advocated just to make sure that if someone's in a rush to do it, um, it shouldn't take that long to do. What you could do also is just to make sure you've got no more fluid going into the system 
by checking on your water track. And once there's no bubbles left, you should be fine. Because the fibres in here are so um, integrated, so well integrated and quite tight, what we need to do is to give them a good tap either side just to make sure that we release any of the air bubbles and again it should be flowing with more fluid coming in. Um, your choice of cannula will be important. Um, having discussed with PJ just now, what you'll probably end up doing is having a dual lumen cannula going in. If the fireman's passed that round, that's the small one. You wouldn't be using that one. There'd be a 22 French or 24 French. Um, the ease of the dual lumen is one cannula, um, but it will only be giving CO2 clearance. You need to have high blood flows to get oxygenation, and that won't happen with these smaller cannulas. happy with that ready to go. The machine is um, battery back up as well and we'll introduce that to the machine when you're ready. On. Press and hold to switch the machine on, it's not a light press, you have to make sure you're putting the machine on with intent. Our machine sits with the sorry with the lung fitting on the sides um, with the impeller on this side. You can see that it's ready to fit on this side for you, so it's already set up, pretty much ready to go. You wouldn't be addressing it like that, and that sounds like a common sense thing to do. But just trying to eliminate common sense, really. That will sit in its bracket like that. The pumps have a, a very clever arm that works as a robotic arm, moving around in, in every direction you wish to. Click the impeller into place and have this uppermost as much as you can. So if there was any stasis or any air bubbles, it would directly flow straight into the lung and you could de-air from there. So that's the purpose of doing that. Let's just There's also the ability to close the clamp on here to stop that from moving around. You'll have a standard trans well, a transducer set within the circuit that will need to be primed and run through. And they will attach onto the three-way taps that we've already connected up that are here on the circuit that we say will be obsolete at some point soon, so bear that in mind. <coughs> Red buns are uppermost. P1, P2 and P3. The only important part is that we attach the right transducer to the right label that's on the machine here. So I'm trying to detangle and not knit everything straight away. <coughs> P1 is here. Uh, P1 is the suction pressure. That's the pressure that's been sucking from the patient and, and will be the most important pressure that we will be guided on. The higher the pressure of that, the more, the more hemolysis we will be causing. is in between the impeller and the membrane, the pre-membrane pressure in case there's any clots, and P3 is going back to the patient in case there's any kinks or risk of exsanguination, which doesn't happen.
There's a flow sensor to attach to the system that has an arrow pointing in the right direction of flow. If we look at the, the systems here, we're taking from the patient with that arrow, giving back with that. So we're looking to be measuring the flow going back to the patient. And we've also put that just after the CVDH port. boot the screen up, the first thing you will see is the home page. What this is showing you is the, the head box here, which is the... I can't see. What you see is what's attached on here. If there's anything not attached, it will be red. If there is anything faulty, there will be an alert to it as well. That's the brains of the outfit. That's the expensive bit, which is... I know it's upside down here, ready to take a cup of coffee into it if it needed to. No one else has it that way up, but I'm not going to interfere just yet. Once we're happy that we've got everything connected that we should have, which was the flow sensor was the last alarm that we had, we press X. Then it's looking to do some standard um, tests and configurations and zeroings. What it wants to do is our transducers to start with. So, taps up. Ports out. You can press each one individually, or there's a, on the right hand side, which you won't see it from the back, it says P1 to P4. If you press that, these are the values that have been measured here. They all zero for you automatically. That needs to be done once a shift, but not with a new system. Okay. Press X to continue. Then it asks um, priming mode. If we press the priming mode in the bubbles on the touch screen, it will go yellow. That will mean that I can prime the system without it alarming with air detection in there. So that's what we're going to do. The pump light has come on, which means it's ready to, to start, and I can move this dial. That will then change the impeller, which is now moving around and rotating, to give us a blood flow. And we can let that do its thing to make sure we've pushed or purged any extra bubbles out that we might not have seen before, or equally, I introduced some from the transducers going on because these were fairly dry and still are. I'm going to stop the pump now because I've introduced a heap of air and I'm just going to angle this a bit better to make sure I've got all the air out of the impeller. The risk being that you may end up with clotting if you had a large air, uh, air bubble in there and you had blood meeting that, that it would, it would um, freeze the system completely. Clicked into place. And fine. Pump light back on to activate the pump. Turn your dial. It has got increments in there. It's not a free wheel. You will feel that, but it's very, very sensitive with saline in. Slightly less so with blood. What you can do at this point as well is to push the system uh, with oxygen. Which is where you'll be causing your, your CO2 and um, some of your oxygenation to occur. Put that on a flow meter that's protected, that you're not going to be able to have a physio come around and maybe um, bag the patient with that oxygen supply that should be going to here instead of um, a water bag that's not relevant. Start off very slowly, one to two litres of flow only of, of sweet gas flow. The conflicting message here is you've got oxygen flow and blood flow that we have to remember which one is which. When we're not, we can't just talk about flow in, in independently. So a low sweet gas flow of oxygen and high um, blood flow will be helpful. If I press the priming mode off again, that will stop the pump and I can move to the next stage, which is just giving me some uh, alerts and alarms that are part of um, the system. 
Um, just going backwards, I probably should have mentioned at the start, um, I did this, this, this talk in Worcester a little while ago, and everyone was sitting there looking um, fairly intent and interested, but they needed to use it within two weeks, and they had to remember what I told them at that point, because I couldn't come and help them the next time we went on a patient on a Sunday afternoon. So bear in mind, if ever it comes to use, use your heads together of what, what you may see. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to help this time, um, but I couldn't then. Zero flow clamp. There's no flow going through the system at the minute, but what it's asking for is a zero on here as part of its um, calibration. I've <coughs> accept that by pressing that. Move on. One of your alarms here is um, you can have zero flow if you have any bubbles detected by the flow sensor, or you can have it just alert that you've got bubbles in there, depending on how you feel about micro bubbles going into the vein or whether you want to stop the system completely because you fear um, air embolism. The safer method is to have zero flow with bubbles detection, depending on how many bubbles you get. And then you're ready to go. Here's my other micro bubble in here. The lights come on again to tell me that the pump is active and ready to go when you're ready. What you will do is then take this system to the patient. This is where you have the conflict of sterile versus non relatively non sterile. These are big clamps to help prevent loss of your fluid when you're taking off the U-bend again. Take to the patient, you will have your cannula and this end together, you will have a big 60 mil syringe of fluid that you will just, one person will be trickling in and then nip the two together to make sure there's no gaps and then seal and do the same for the other side. Once you're happy that you've got your complete circuit ready to go and your cannula is stitched in, um, you're ready to start. You can take a blood gas beforehand, you can give your heparin bolus once the cannula in, depending on how you see fit there, um, and that will give you potentially longer lung life as well. And when you're ready to go, just dial in. Gently to start with, you want to have roughly around about 300 uh, mils per minute to make sure we don't shock the patient because we will end up taking off potentially um, 300, 400 mils of, of fluid um, of non red blood cells. Wait until you've got a full circuit of blood, and if you're happy with that, then start increasing the flows that you expect and to get some achievement of um, CO2 clearance. The trending graph here, I've never seen any use in doing that and looking at those numbers at all whatsoever, um, but they are there if you need them. Then it's a case of looking at what your P1 pressure is. This will be a negative pressure. Um, Minus 50 is what's written down somewhere to say that you shouldn't be going greater than that or you will start causing hemolysis. I've seen people riding them out at minus 70s, minus 90s um, with no, is no issue at all, but that's a choice that you will make at that point depending on how much um, blood flow you want to have. The higher the blood flow, the higher the P1 pressure. The more CO2 you want to clear, the more sweep gas flow you put through. And then find your balance between adjusting your ventilator settings down 10% um, at a time whilst you're changing this going up, ventilator coming down, and then find your right, your balance of pH, CO2, and, and PO2. And then it sits quietly in the corner, doing nothing. Because the blood flows are a lot higher, it doesn't have the risk of clotting as the same as a CVVH would do. Your CVVH is normally around 300 mils, so it's a, it's, it's a far better system than that. If you did have a risk of clotting, what you would do is just increase your blood flow even higher, um, as much as your P1 could tolerate, and then that would also give you better lung life as well. Monitor your APTTs um, four hourly, six hourly, four to six hourly, depending on uh, whether they're at risk, if they're coagular paths or not. Um, and away you go. The exhaust for the CO2 is this technical hole that's under here. That's where the CO2 is expe expelled from. Make sure that that stays um, open. Because we've got cold, dry gas hitting the membranes in here. You can imagine that you've got these hundreds of straws that are overlapping each other. The, the fluid, that, sorry, the air is going through the middle of the straws and the blood's touching the outside. You have a combination of, of um, warm blood hitting cold gas and you get condensation and rain out dripping out of here. It says every eight hours to turn your sweep gas flow up to 12 to 15 for one or two seconds to push any of that fluid out of the system. That just helps to allow a lot more uh, contact between the blood and the, uh, the, the straws that are in there. Um, whenever I've done the test, I've always got fluid out a lot, a lot less than eight hours beforehand, depending on a cold room with condensation as well. You, um, so in a cold air-conditioned room, you may get more condensation and more dripping as well. So just be aware that when you see fluid, you think it's leaking. It's not. It's because you've got condensation and rain out. 
Um, housekeeping. From a nursing perspective, keep an eye on the cannula, make sure they're in place and stitched in. Uh, we've done the APTTs. If it's a femoral site, it should be the, the cannula should be far enough in the vena cava that you shouldn't have to worry too much about um, log rolls, but it, have some due diligence because we, they are armoured cannula. You've seen them, they're thick, they're heavy, but any, nothing is kink-proof when it comes to these cannula. It's not the same as a bass cat. It's a far greater cannula than that. But don't be lifting their leg up massively here to turn them over. That, that, that's not probably the best thing to do. Um, and that really is it. As simple as that. CVVH for the lungs. Question? Can you put the cannula in the neck like you do with that Yes. Where's that cannula gone that you were moving? The, that's an 18. The 22 French can go in the neck, which is ideal, um, and that will allow mobilisation as well if, if you get to that stage. If you get dynamic enough, people will be mobilised, hopefully not ventilated, and, and then um, the neck line makes its difference. The 24 French is femoral only because it's 27 centimetres long and a bit, bit, bit cumbersome to be sticking out the neck, and you can also go through the, um, the right atrium, which you probably would avoid uh, if you could. So bear that in mind as well. So yes, you can do neck, um, but you have to use the right cannula. I've seen some people put a 24 in, in the neck and just make sure that they don't go far enough in. But what you must make sure is that the last hole here, which is the, the, the drainage suck ports here, that that is actually in the vessel. If it's not in the vessel, then you're going to cause a huge amount of trauma, uh, blood coming out of the system into the extra vascular space, which you don't want to do. So if you do get here in the light, how do you get rid of that? If you did, there'd be an alarm that would tell you that you've got um, air from that flow sensor, this does that. What you could do is to take out from your um, last three-way tap. If there's big columns of air, then you'd, you'd stop the system, turn your three-way tap to uh, an open port, stick a syringe on and suck it out. Equally, um, which some people like, some people don't, you can stick a three-way tap on the single cannulas that are the ones that are closest to the patient's neck. Not everyone likes doing that because three-way taps can be quite brittle plastic, but it's an option that you have. Um, oh, there you go. Three-way taps there. So you put a three-way tap on there and then you can take your blood out um, just before it gets back to the patient. Okay. And your yellow caps that you said to keep. Well done. In the pack you have a various uh, assortment of spares of, that are sterile. You've got spares of these. You can put these back on um, once your system's set up and you know you haven't got any air in there. Written down in the literature somewhere that says that you should be taking these caps off to allow de airing to occur every eight hours. I've never seen any benefit doing that. I've never seen any air escape out or hiss out or, or any, any benefit, but it just says to do that. So these caps can stay on. As I said, there's a hydrophobic membrane in here. One of the big don'ts. Uh, do. There's a quite a dynamic medic but we decided he was going to take an intra-lung gas to work out what the difference was between the pre and post patient and he pierced it which was great because then it ruined the system they had to change it. So it's not a case of common sense, just don't do that. You can, if you wish to be dynamic, take some blood from the system here from your three-way taps and do that. But again, I don't know what benefit you get from doing that. The system C marked for 29 days of use. Um, whether or not you'll be using it for that long ever, I don't know. Um, you probably get a, an idea of which way your patient's going after five to six days, um, depending on single organ failure or more. Um, the, to check the efficacy of it, if you were having issues that you thought there was clotting, what you may see <coughs> is this um, discoloration on the outside, that's normal. The only time you know your lung's not working is if your CO2's climbing, and then you've got an idea that things aren't so well. So there's a test you can do. You can take a blood gas, then you can switch off your sweet gas flow for two minutes and then take another blood gas and then you work out the difference between the two. And if it's less than 20% um, decrease or increase of CO2, then it's worth changing it. If it's more than that, then leave it alone. We haven't done taking it out yet, we'll do that afterwards. Any other questions so far? Sorry, can I just, I just missed it. You say 22? Yes, 22 or a 24. Yes. 22 for the neck, 24 for the thumb. The 22 is 17 centimetres long, which is why it's more tolerant to not go anywhere near the uh, right atrium. But your guide wire still needs to be pushed basically to their toes uh, to make sure you're going to bypass any, any heart. So some people use a CRM X-ray to put it in, some people don't. 
Um, <coughs> it depends on people's experience with bigger cannula, really. Um, okay, there's, there's two answers. If your blood flow is greater than two and a half litres, then you can go for less uh, APTT because higher blood flow means less chance of clotting. If it's a slower um, blood flow, then you probably increase to about 60 seconds. There is uh, papers to suggest that you can use aspirin as an anticoagulant. Uh, the, the lung likes that. Um, I'd have to check up on the doses of those. Some people that uh, have been intolerant, um, there is fragment and another anticoagulant that helped me out in Ecoprostenol. Um, quite expensive, but you can use, also use that. Um, so weaning, let's say we're going to increase this as much as we can. What we want to do is to thrash this lung, not theirs. So we're bringing the CO2s down. <coughs> what that will do is allow us to have um, protective ventilation, hopefully five mils per kilogram less, there's talking about ultra protective ventilation now which may be three mils per kilogram, but you still need to have a decent peep as well, make sure that we're not causing any intellectual trauma that goes with that, that's intellectual trauma by the way, that's the international side for that. So once we get them out of the, the, that period of, of, of bio trauma that's going on and they're improving, you should start weaning the ventilation and also if you can get them to spontaneously breathe, this is certainly from a German perspective, they're, they're quite dynamic with knocking off their stuff quite early, far more than we are in this country. They don't see the same fighting of ventilators that we do somehow, I don't know what they do differently. Um, but they try and wake their patients up as much as possible to get their breathing and their, their, their breathing pump, the muscle of the diaphragm helps them wean a lot quicker. When that's done, what you can do, and you're happy with your gases that you've got stability, is to reduce the sweet gas flow again, so you're not um, giving them the support and see if their lungs are then able to clear the CO2 and not this lung. <coughs> and then take that down all the way to zero eventually over time. And once you've got to that, leave it on for 12 hours just as a complete shunt of doing nothing. The threshold to take this out should be very high, because if you ever have a rebound or bounce back, then the problem will be that you'll have to um, put fresh cannulas in again on the sites that have already been used, which isn't easy. Um, and when you've done that and you're happy to take it out, what you could do, depending on where your three-way taps are, if you've got them in the neck, would be to just... Clamp above here, put your saline onto here, so the suction would be taking the fluid from the, the bag of saline all the way through with the pump working away. What we'll do is turn the pump down, turn the speed down so you're being a little bit safe. Saline through the whole system, give them their unit of, back, unit of blood back, 380 mils at least, and then once you've got rosé all the way through, then you can stop the pump. Stop and confirm that you want to stop. There are lockouts in the screen that we can have or, or take out, depending on what people want to do. Um, what it asks you to do is just to press the one and two as I did there to access the screen to then make a change. Um, if people don't know what they're doing there, it's probably likely they shouldn't be going anywhere near it, which is why those lockouts are there. Um, other things to consider on the monitor um, is your alarms. We've, we've not discussed that yet. Anytime you press any of these values here, all of the tabs related to that open up. So let's say flow, for example. We can set a minimum flow. We know we don't want to go lower than 450 mils. Um, it's, it becomes ineffective by then. So we could set that <coughs> in here. So the limits goes yellow, 0.500 will have. And we can press the bell, and that's now active. And then that highlights <coughs> a little bell up here saying that we have an alarm ready for that. And because I've, I've not got a pump speed on there, it's alarming to tell me that. You can set a revs per minute. This is a um, revolution per minute of the impeller. It says one per minute here. It looks like an L per minute, which is a bit deceiving. Um, there's no point in setting anything on that. I don't think there's any um, use. You're more worried about your blood flow more than anything else. Your P1 that we've talked about uh, a few times, you can set at minus 50. It's already there. And just press your alarm. So every time it goes greater than that, it will let you know. To improve that, you could give some more inotropes or you could give a fluid bolus to help bring it down. 
more filled they are, the less uh, volume, uh, P1 pressure will be sucking, sucking out as, as great. P2 pressures around about 400, that's a standard, that's been um, written down again somewhere with an overlung. And the last one, um, depending on what the setting is or the pressure is of that, the, of your P3, set it 30 above um, that, that number. And so if there's any increase in pressure from the return, then it will allow to give you a clue. Because you won't know what that number is until you've set up to start with. We need to transfer the patient for a scanner or whatever. Can the machine and uh, let the machine resuscitate and then connect it back? Yeah, um, it's got battery backup. Batteries are in here, <coughs> um, and what you can do is just take the batteries with, take the whole system. It's the best thing to do because you've still got monitoring. If you took off um, the lung and the impeller on its own, then you don't have the full monitoring of what the blood flow is. So if I disconnect from here. Like with a CVVH machine, you could never really push someone around, but you, you could do with this. That you, CT is going to be tricky because the length of uh, the line that you've got going into them. So it now makes it portable next to the bed. So back to theatres or wherever you want to go. And if we don't want to take the machine with the patient? You can disconnect here if you wish to. What, what do you looking to take with you? Just the... the the what impeller. Then, as if we just gonna replace for the filter um, for transfer and we let, let the filter recirculate if we can do the same with this machine or oh, we we circulate the machine. Number for zero. No. Once you're in, you're in. You're, you're committed. You can't really disconnect and do anything else. You arguably um, you could bung the ends of the cannula with a big bladder syringe, but that's no, that's risky, you wouldn't do that. In an emergency. These are the batteries that are running the system normally, but you can also um, hot, sp hot swap the batteries here. So if I plug this into here, that gives me life into this system. I'll stop the pump, disconnect. Here. I could now press the play button and then increase the arrows to whichever impeller speed I want to go up to and that will then spin and give me a blood flow there if I wish to. You could take the blood flow off, you could arguably run this just on the bedside if you wish to. You could have that off here, as long as you've got your oxygen still attached, you could take your transducers off and just fly by the seat of your pants by doing that. I'd probably, well, I don't know when you do that, I don't know whenever you find the need to, but it's a possible possibility. If you have an issue with the machine, all you've got to do is press the pump um, light till the light comes on and just turn that dial to get your blood flow back up. Invariably, if they are sick patients and you've got a high amount of oxygen going through here, they're going to be sick and very dependent on this. So if they had a crash or um, cardiac arrest, lower the flow slightly, excuse me, and do what you need to do um, to get them back. It's not going to harm by being on, it may help. The, the old system was AV, which was a, a risk of pushing venous blood into the artery, which wasn't good. This is slightly different, um, but hopefully you'll get a good idea of if your patient's that sick beforehand. Any other questions? What's your most common alarms? P1. Depends on when, how tight you set these. Um, that would be the one that would go off the most, because that's the one that concerns you. Um, Hemolysis is, is an odd one. It, it's, it can cause effect later on down the line, weeks later. It can increase potassium, um, but generally people are mindful of it and not too greedy. It depends on the patient's condition. If you put too small a cannula in and want too high a blood flow, you've got a conflict straight away, which is where the, the concept of having too cannula in, too big a cannula, makes a difference. The 
because in the 24 French that we're talking about here, which is maybe it sounds a whopper, but the internal diameter of each is only 13 French because of the size that you're choosing. So you're asking a lot of a 13 French cannula to get high flows. But two cannulas has its own issues, um, less mobility, two puncture sites, etc. But from the experience that we've had, it's the way forward. It makes sense. But you need to get experience first with one cannula, I think, before you start making decisions about what you're going to do next. Um, What's the maximum pump speed you can pump with 22 French? It all depends on your P1. It's not. It's not necessarily. You can go up as much as you want with your pump speed. It's at the detriment of your P1. Um, in saying that, you, you're never going to. Your highest blood flow you're going to get on a 22 French is about one and a half meters. Not much more than that. Depending on how well filled they are as well, and depends on if the cannula is in either the vena cava from a femoral, femoral point of view or the uh, right internal jugular um, and the IBC there. The capacity of this is four and a half litres, so that's all this will take. But the higher the blood flows you have at that level, you've got less contact time of the blood in the lung, which will reduce. It's almost like a curve that just gets great and then just dips down because the next lung up is a bigger lung with a bigger surface area, which will benefit you. That's more ECMO. We're looking to have more CO2 equal. That's where you get your benefit from. And how many patients you will get like that, I don't know. That's a great question to ask you. How many times have you thought about getting this out in the last six months? Probably less since we've had the ECMO service. Yeah. And that's important to, to pick your patients. Um, what is it you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to prevent intubation or are you trying to um, wean and extubate? Is it ARDS or rebound or what, what has happened that's caused them to need it? And how long have they been ventilated for? Going on the ECMO criteria, if they've been, anybody's been ventilated for seven days, they're not interested in, the, in, the, in your patients generally. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what you're trying to achieve straight away. This, this well, clear CO2, it's, it's brilliant at that. That's not an issue, it's a matter of what patients you choose with the comorbidities that go with them, I guess. And then the other take home message from Novolung always is to make sure that you get them spontaneously breathing, get that pump going, and that, that could be tricky. Any more? Believable? Did I make it up? Press one, two. To switch off the machines, also just um, point of order. Make sure the pump is off. Press and hold the off button until it starts to shut down. And then confirm by pressing the alarm button and releasing. And it switch off. So when we're disconnected, when you're finishing, you take the thing out at the same time. Can't do that as well. Yes. You can, uh, yeah, I've seen some people, um, if you've got a stasis of blood for long enough, then you need to take the cannula out. I've seen some people trying to protect the cannula. They're not, it's not designed to be just used as an interim to come back to later. Uh, once you're in, you're in, and once you're out, you're out. Can I just ask you, once the line's in, how long can you keep the line in and run the circuit for? 29 days. Okay. There's a few cases where it's used as long as that, um, waiting for the transplants. Any contraindications? Anyone can't use it on? HIT patients are, uh, because it's, it's heparin bonded. So if you've got someone ultra sensitive to heparin, then you'd probably be a bit wary of that. Um, after that, um, it depends on the cannula choice and how big they are as well. If you've got someone that's really obese, then you don't want to use a small cannula. You've got to make sure you're going to get within the vena cava to make sure you're going to get the ultimate blood flow. So that's one of the contraindications after that. Some of the previous research said something about um, rapid change in like the carbon dioxide when you start the therapy. Yeah. What's the general feeling on that now? Because there was some adverse sort of statements you... that come out about suddenly dropping cerebral blood flow, yeah. suddenly constricting down. Because you know, to start with, two of twenty and. Soonish. There's there's a lot of people. Down to 10, yeah. so. There's a lot of people talking about intracellular and extracellular um, changes, and you'll have to allow that time to 
have equilibrium. I don't know how long that takes, but we only start at one litre of sweep gas flow. You can do as much blood flow as you like, which is one litre of that. That's the bit that you don't want to crash their CO2 because you will cause cerebral ischemia. Where it may be 10, if you put that down to 4, because everyone's a bit keen to get the, the, the sweep gas flow down, then you're also going to have a negative effect and make them alkal hugely alkalotic. And that's in a very short space of time. That can't be good. I don't know what the evidence is. I couldn't say. Um, I don't have a, a def definitive answer, but we always say go slowly. Once you've made, your, you had 20 minutes of this system, you will always try and do a blood gas and see what benefit you've got, and then make a difference to your ventilator and also more sweep gas changes. So you, as you go up with your sweep gas flow, you come down with your ventilator by 10% every time, and that, that's your uh, minute volume. So that will mean either your peak pressure or your rate, and those are the two that you've got to be looking at. So once you've got those down to normal levels, it's every 20 minutes you're making that change, and that will help with that equilibrium being hopefully um, sorted internally. I don't know how long it takes a cell to get sorted, unfortunately. If anyone can help me, this room should be able to answer that question. Eyes on the floor, everyone. Um, it would. It depends on where it is, and again, it depends on people's tolerance of an air bubble that go into a vein. Some people say it would be absorbed. I don't know that. I've heard that 10 mils will kill someone. I've heard that it takes a lot more than that. Um, I think it's good to have due diligence and not expect the body to cope with air. It should be without. The air trap is here, arguably, so all it will do is just you take out these and it will help absorb, absorb out, so diffuse out is the way. Uh, when we stop a therapy, is there any way to return blood? Or? Yes, but we said we just attach a bag of fluid to either a three-way tap that's nearby, or equally, the what we could do is attach it to the P1. That would mean that you would have arguably that much blood left in here, but you're keeping the system relatively sterile and not waving around any. Um, you're not disconnecting a circuit. You're using it within the circuit a three-way tap. Bag of fluid, I'd be giving set onto here, keep the pump going very slowly, let it take its fluid in all the way as much as you can. That's 240 mils in there straight away, so that's going to be a, a small unit, but it's always worth giving them their blood back. Um, even if there are um, signs of, of clotting in here, you're not going to flush that back into them any more than you would when it was running with blood in it. So just put in gen a gentle 300 mils an hour of fluid through the system, give them their blood back. Now ticking for your next patient, I think. By all means, have a go yourselves. I think it's worth going through the motions of this rather than watching someone do it. You need to see how it feels and also how the, this interacts and how easy this is to use. It's a monitor at the end of the day, it's there to alarm, it's not there to trip you up or anything else, it's just to support you. No different to just remember this is CVVH for the lungs and it's a lot quieter than CVVH for the lungs um, and you don't have to change it every 72 hours either. The slaving on, we didn't discuss that, the slaving on of a system. Um, if you were stuck and you needed to put CVVH onto a system or you're short of lines, you'll put them onto here. You've got arrows indicating where the blood's going to come from to your CVVH, around its loop, and back in. And then that goes to the patient, cleansed. Um, if you do do that, make sure you um, anticoagulate appropriately because you're going to have two extracorporeal systems um, in place. Your patients will get cold because there's a lot more blood outside the body as well. Um, and if you've got a Prisma, that will probably... What machines have you got here? Aquarius. Okay. I don't quite know what happens there, but you've got positive pressure pushing to the CVVH machine. Normally it's a negative pressure that they draw out. So you have to make sure that it can tolerate taking a positive pressure into it, which makes some machines go, hmm, what's that all about? So, I don't know. You're, uh, that's worth getting in touch with Aquarius. I'm sure it's a software change, but if ever you need it. That's how you do it. Is there a minimum flow rate through, through this? You won't get the benefit of CO2 clearance after 500 mils. That's where we set the low alarm because it's pointless then. It's not going to do its job. Previously, it used to be near a liter or something like that. In the AV system, anything above 500 was, was beneficial, but you, you want to get as high as you can. If your patient's that sick, you're going to need higher blood flows than that anyway. You don't want to be messing around with the lower numbers, there's no point, because you've got more risk of clotting then as well. Mm 